My name is Rachel Mark, and I'm the um, regional leader of the, uh, the Harrisburg Chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. And I'm um, so glad to see everybody here tonight. I think it'll be an exciting event. Uh, first, some housekeeping um, information. The restrooms are back there, and there are snacks over here, and coffee, and water. And uh, there's an information table back there with all kinds of information and sign-up sheets. Uh, we also have some cards, uh, three by five cards. If you could fill out a question as it goes along, you might think of a question. And uh, Alvira from the League of Women Voters is going to be collecting them. And you can um, just pass them over to her. Um, do we have any elected officials here or um, staff members with us tonight? You're from Senator Teplitz's office? Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Sandy Valley. Sandy Valley. Sandy Valley. And Matt Weir from the Hershey uh, Supervisors. Thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight. His name is Joseph Robertson, and he's the Strategic Coordinator for the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a nonpartisan group. Uh, he's the um, Emeritus Faculty Member of the Villanova Center for Energy and Environment Education. He's the author of the 2010 report, Building a Green Economy, on the economics of carbon pricing and the transition to clean, renewable fuels. And he's in the process of co-authoring a 100-year plan for a clean economic transition. Joseph is the founder and president of Geoversif and Envisioning, a social benefit commercial endeavor that aims to discover and deploy the ingredients of a clean future of global abundance. From 2000 to 2007, he was lead online translator into Spanish for the Earth Policy Institute's Eco Economy and Plan B updates on ecological economies. We're very, very happy to have Joe with us tonight. <clears throat> so that's a lovely introduction. Um, a couple of things just to note before we get started. Um, there's going to be an opportunity for those of you who are uh, in the audience listening to the presentations to ask questions, to write them down, so that during a moderated discussion, some of those questions will go directly to the panelists. And then after that discussion, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. Um, I'm going to give a brief but very jam-packed introduction to the topics of the evening. And then the other panelists are going to go a little bit deeper and give you more, more information. So bear with me as I kind of tear a few minutes. Um, the basic idea here I think that we're all trying to come to grips with is the fact that everything we're doing is actually contributing to the future climate that we'll be experiencing. Um, we're dealing with a situation where natural life support systems are under stress in ways that really don't have, I'm sorry, we're, we're dealing with a situation where natural life support systems are under stress in ways that don't have a real precedent in the history of the human species and we're responsible. Um, these are diatoms, by the way. A lot of people don't know what they are, but they are a microscopic organism that is responsible for producing 20% of the breathable oxygen on Earth. Before they existed, there was not a, an atmosphere conducive to human existence on this planet. Um, they're under stress. The mixed layer in which they live is being stratified by changes in temperature and acidification. And so that means that there's less ability for the oceans to actually absorb and sink carbon. Um, it's not a catastrophic situation yet, but it's a sign of where things are going, that something so pervasive is already under stress. The basics are greenhouse gases trap heat. They're changing the temperature of the world, oceans and atmosphere. It's not just air, it's air and water. Very important detail is that we don't make maps like this anymore, right? We're not trying to just create static pictures of the Earth. We have tools that allow us to see what the world looks like in real time. And some of this is going to be covered later. But we can see when the world is hotter than it normally is. 
and basically that's what it always is now. Um, and the trends are all pointing in the direction of pretty severe increases. This is what the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration projects for 2065. You'll notice that the yellow to red range is about 3 to 16 degrees Fahrenheit increase. Um, 16 is, for all the things we know or think we know, um, basically wildly unmanageable. It's not something that we want to see. So that's what the rest of this evening is about, is the kind of things that happen already because we have too much thermal energy trapped in the Earth's atmosphere and oceans and it gets released, right? These are real world costs. This is something that's obvious. It's easy for people like me who are from the Jersey Shore to understand. But there are things that are a little bit more significant, actually, when we think of the global situation. Um, chronic pervasive drought that's getting worse over the last several years, not just in the United States, but actually in most of the world's agricultural regions. We're having drought on a larger scale and over longer times than we're used to. Um, last year, 50% of counties in the United States experienced drought of what was considered to be disaster levels. Um, this is a failure of the marketplace to account for the true cost of how we do business with energy. Right? Those hidden costs are adding expense to everything we do, and everything we do is adding future expense. Imagine, for instance, if we had to replace deliberately through our technology and our know-how and our spending the natural services um, the natural services that nature provides, like bees, for instance, spontaneously pollinating. When those things unravel, we don't have the ability to create a solution anymore. So what we're basically talking about here tonight is how do we replace a flawed system in which we live all day every day with a system where these problems don't exist and are not mounting, right? We have to internalize those costs. What that means is that we have businesses who are doing what they do in a way where they put their cost on us. We are financing their business model directly and indirectly. If we were not, they would not be able to make money. As much as the big uh, energy companies are good at making money, they're able to because we finance it. So just a real rudimentary primer, there are five basic ways that you can price carbon in order to make the industry and its investors pay the costs. One is the status quo, the way we're doing it now. We're not internalizing the costs, we're taking them on, like a giant global insurance policy for the industry, but which is actually working to our disadvantage. Another is regulation, which can be very expensive. Um, and it has to be expensive because it has to be pervasive. And when you talk about energy, where energy is used all over the world, uh, getting regulation down to the scale where it needs to be to actually capture everything that's happening is expensive. If it's less expensive, it's gonna be less effective. So there are reasons to do it, but it's not the perfect solution. There's licensed emissions trading, cap and trade, where you say, here's the most you can emit, and if you want to continue emitting, you have to buy credits from somebody, maybe a government, maybe someone else who's doing it. We'll hear about that later. There's the traditional carbon tax, which sort of works like a sin tax. You create pain for consumers so that they stop doing what they're doing. Um, and then there's the revenue neutral carbon tax, which is a way of pricing carbon, but where you're not necessarily trying to create pain for the economy, you're trying to facilitate a transition through a smart use of the revenues. Um, I work for Citizens Climate Lobby, and there are a lot of Citizens Climate Lobby volunteers here, also on the panel. And um, we advocate something called a carbon fee and dividend. Basically, you apply a fee at the source, the mine, the well, or the port of entry to the United States. You return 100% of the revenues directly to households. Both the fee and the dividend go up over time just to make sure that we're all playing on a level playing field. Countries that don't have a similar policy, their businesses would pay a fee at the border. The Carbon Tax Center says two-thirds of households would come out even or better with 100% dividend. What that means is that all of the pass-through costs, what happens when a big oil company says we're gonna raise our prices and then everyone else after them has to raise theirs, would be covered for two-thirds of households and for the businesses that they frequent. Since it's revenue neutral, 100% goes back to households. That means there's no new bureaucracy, there's no new spending, there's no reason for anyone in Congress to say, I can't support this, this is gonna grow government, or this is going to create a big uh, you know, authoritarian system. Um, in this kind of policy environment, what happens is the marketplace changes around you. You don't have to necessarily be the person who's paying attention to the cost of everything. 
what will happen is over the first few years, things won't change immediately, but investment will move to where it needs to be so that the marketplace changes. Your power company will be buying cheap, clean energy without you having to notice that it's happening. And there'll be other options available, and ultimately, abundant clean energy will be the market standard. So, what's the challenge? Why isn't this the normal thing already? Why didn't we already do this? <laughs> because there are people who get paid a lot of money and who work really hard all day, every day, to make sure it doesn't happen. So, a few years ago, a man named Marshall Saunders started Citizens Climate Lobby, and we started bringing ordinary citizens to Capitol Hill. In our June conference each year, we've been doubling in size. Last year we had 367 volunteer citizen lobbyists from across North America. This year we're going to be bringing 700 to Capitol Hill on June 24th. We have 170 active local chapters in five countries. Most of those are in the United States. We have new chapters in development on five continents and more than 60 in the United States alone. And then just really quickly, a little bit of bragging, but it's an important kind of bragging because our volunteers work really hard to make sure that they can get published. We help them to understand the things that you can do that make a letter more likely to get printed, that make it more constructive contribution to community dialogue, which is what they want on those editorial pages. Last year, our volunteers published 1,267 letters to the editor and 251 op-eds. Combined, those pieces were published in newspapers with an average circulation of about 80,000. Three readers or more see each paper printed on average. 40% read the opinion pages. That means 96,000 people on average read anything published by Citizens Climate Lobby volunteers. That's 145.7 million views of printed material, actual eyes on actual print. And if you assume that some of those are repeat readers, about 20 million people. So this is ordinary people making sure that they're not just engaging Congress. We had 679 meetings with the US House and Senate last year, um, but also engaging communities and the press. And so basically the idea is we can do a lot of things to go beyond the small stuff, changing our behavior, making sure that each one of us in our own lives is responsible, we should all be doing that. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. We can actually all be part of a global solution. Um, and so now, the next section is going to be individual presentations from each of our panelists.